All right. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome. Uh, Monty Murray, I'm president of the South White Conservationists, and tonight's program is both live here at uh, Bass Lake Park in Holly Springs, and it's also being webcast um, across the state uh, via Zoom. And uh, it's also being recorded, so those that uh, weren't able to make it tonight can uh, can see the, the recording of this as well. So South Wake Conservationists is an all-volunteer organization, and we're part of the North Carolina Wildlife Federation, and we serve South Southern Wake County. Our mission is to conserve and improve wildlife habitat and diversity through conservation projects and public outreach. And public outreach is really a key part of what we do. Uh, wildlife habitats and their habitats that they depend on are in jeopardy, as many of you know. Um, we want to inform the community about our natural environment and mobilize people locally, you folks, uh, to help wildlife and the ecosystem that we all depend on. Wildlife faces many challenges today, as you all know. And just a couple of examples, the Endangered Species Act rules have been eroded over the past few years. After 50 years of success, where they've had 291 species that have been saved from extinction. The EPA just this past month lifted protections from more than half of the wetlands in the United States. These are all working against the ecosystem and wildlife. And we're here as the people that can make a difference and actually work for, for the uh, environment and for the wildlife. So the grassroots effort by conservationists like you are needed now more than ever and can make a real difference. Please join us if you haven't already. Before we begin, I wanna have, introduce Luke Bennett. Luke is the conservation coordinator with the North Carolina Wildlife Federation and he will go over a few uh, details about how the questions and answers will be done. I'm speaking to the people on Zoom as well, uh, as well as um, um, moderating the session. No questions yet, John. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Monty. Um, yeah, my name is Luke Bennett. I'm the conservation coordinator for the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. I've been working for just over a year with the organization. Um, and it's really been a pleasure. I tell people often that I, I think I have the best job in the world. Uh, being a 24-year-old kid working for North Carolina Wildlife and Habitat has been a real a treasure to, to be in this position. Um, I get to work with a lot of inspiring and passionate people that work together to um, protect, conserve, and restore North Carolina wildlife and habitat. Um, so just real quick, some logistical things tonight. Uh, like Monty said, we are broadcasting live on Zoom. And for those folks, if you'd like to ask a question tonight, you can type your question into the chat at any time. We will uh, save those questions until the very end. We'll make sure we have some time. Um, and for the folks that are in person here tonight, if you'd like to ask a question, we'll have someone running the mic around and you can ask your question into the mic. So I'll pass it back over to Monty, who will introduce our speaker for this evening. Thanks, Luke. We have a great program for you tonight. Our speaker is a naturalist and an educator who enjoys exploring and showing others all the wonderful aspects of our natural world. His museum career has spanned over 40 years, 20 years at Discovery Place Science in Charlotte, and another 20 years now with the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, where he is head of outreach. He tells personal stories about nature that are like that favorite book that you just can't put down. So please welcome Jerry Reynolds. Thank you, Marty, and thank you so much for uh, welcoming uh, to here tonight. And uh, I've got a lot to show you, so we're going to get right to business here. And this is where I have a microphone in one hand and a clicker in one hand. And I know that Luke and Monty have a betting pool going on. How long will it take before I try to click, click my microphone talking to my clicker? So anyway, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. We're almost there. Uh oh, that's not you like to hear what you're spinning. Okay. 
Okay. Well, I, I don't have any songs that I can do to kill time here. So anyway, uh, we'll give it just a couple of more. Okay. I think we're... Okay. We're going to ignore the message that it's not working. No, we're not. <laughs> All righty. Okay. I think we're ready to go. Uh, the title of my talk is uh, Back, Backyard Nature. And if what you were expecting are tips on how to take your backyard and do all kinds of wonderful things to it, you're in the wrong place. This is my backyard. I haven't done anything to it except fence it in and let it stay there for the dogs. Now, I live in Johnston County, fairly close to the Wake County line. Uh, there's my house in the subdivision, which, which I have about an acre and a half. Uh, and when I say backyard nature, I consider that patch of woods back there part of my backyard. It is officially is not, but I certainly access it and enjoy uh, exploring it. Now, I'm not the first person to live there. Uh, I find Indian pottery, Native American pottery, in the yard routinely. Just I've got hundreds of pieces of this. So this certainly has been inhabited by the original Americans here, and. Uh, I've even registered this site with the state archaeology office. Uh, I've only found two stone artifacts thus far, but a lot of in, a lot of uh, pottery shards uh, that just wash. They don't wash up. They sort of they're sitting at the surface as rains come and they expose them on the bare surfaces of the backyard. Anyway, this is a drone view of my neighborhood, and I am uh, right there. And the drone view uh, with the snow on the ground, of course, is pretty, but it also shows you the terrain of the woods. Uh, that's my yard. And you can see if your resolution is high enough, you probably could even see dog tracks uh, that are from the dogs in the yard. Uh, the little rectangular area is my prairie, which I'll talk about in a minute. But you can see that there's a stream right behind my house. And this is a little we'll zoomed out a little bit. And the, the stream is actually my back property line. So yes, indeed, I do own a little bit of the woods back there uh, and half of the stream, according to my deed. Uh, but the rest of the woods uh, are in one ownership and they haven't done anything with them. I just hope they never do anything with, with the woods. Uh, but you can see it's, a, it's mostly hardwoods with uh, pine trees. So it is a mixed woods. The pine trees there now are loblolly pines. But this part of the state was certainly mostly in longleaf pine originally. Uh, so, so I have, this is my longleaf pine restoration area in the corner of my yard. I felt that we needed to have some longleaf pine back in the neighborhood. So I planted some there. Now I got tired of mowing the whole front yard. So I stopped mowing part of the front yard and just sort of as a, sort of as a joke, but also just to see what would happen. And so this is what happens. You get a lot of uh, this different stuff growing up like dog fennel and uh, and it just uh, just sort of takes over. Now this is a de a designated Johnson County Prairie, at least designated by me called the Jerry Prairie. but anyway, uh, the wildlife actually seem to like it even though I haven't planted anything there. it does offer shelter and I have seen deer and all kinds of things in that little patch there. It also gets pretty spooky at Halloween. Anyway, back to my backyard. Uh, again, the, the yard is fenced in for our dogs. This is Lily. Uh, but I welcome a lot of other animals to the yard. I have lizards and frogs and all kinds of critters that I welcome there. I don't use any pesticides or anything. And, and they, they take advantage of whatever you offer, whether it's for them or not. Under that cinder block, which is holding an inner gate open, uh, five line skink decided to make a nest there. And I, and I find them in other places uh, you know, around the yard. They, they live in my garage. I, I have five line skinks, a nose, uh, six line race runners patrol my driveway during the, during the day. I, I call them my driveway dragons. So I welcome all of these without really doing anything, anything to the yard. I just, I just let them be basically. And I have snakes uh, from, from like this Northern Brown snake all the way up to a copperhead. Uh, I, I'm not exactly welcoming copperheads, but I know they're there. Uh, and if they're, they're usually back in the woods and if they're a little bit 
close to the house, I'll move them maybe just a little bit deeper into the woods, but they're there and you just have to be aware that wherever you are in North Carolina, you are within their range and just be on the lookout for them. But I have those snakes and all the other species that you would find in Piedmont, North Carolina. Uh, birds, you know, birds are, you know, very, they cohabitate with people very well, as probably many of you know. Uh, I love the I love the Carolina wrens. Uh, they sometimes nest in my garage. In this case, uh, they built a nest in a bucket that I just stuck on an old grill under my deck and uh, nested quite well. The, the young fledged successfully. I never know where they're going to show up uh, building a nest. Of insects, of lots of different insects. And again, this is just a sampler. There's no way I can show you everything within the three hours we have tonight. All right, all right, just one hour. Anyway, beautiful Luna moth. And yeah, I welcome all of the insects. I, I, the only animals I don't welcome are ticks. And if a mosquito's on my on my skin, I don't welcome that. But all the other insects I do welcome. And yeah, I think that you know, the the l losing the diversity of insects is a huge thing. I mean, you know, climate change is huge. Insect change is huge. And as E.O. Wilson put it, uh, these are the little things that run the world, basically. So they're very important. So we need to pay attention to those. I love my toads. I have uh, yard toads, driveway toads. And sometimes in the summer, I have to shoo them off of the driveway to drive in so I, so I don't run over them. And, uh, but I love having them around the house, and I see them frequently. Uh, even the uh, pickerel frog. Uh, which you may think is usually be closer to water, but they spend a lot of time away from water. So I find them in weird places all around my house at different times when I'm moving, when I'm moving cover usually. Uh, tree, tree frogs, I have tree frogs living on my house. Uh, this is one that's on a, uh, in, in the Jerry Prairie on a, on a dog fennel. Uh, gray tree frogs, I have them all around the house. And those are the two most common ones that I see. Uh, of course, the gray tree frog would be very well camouflaged if he stuck to the tree that's behind the fence, but by resting during the day on the, the uh, chain link fence there, I could, I could see that frog from a half a yard away. But anyway, I, I welcome all of these. They're all great neighbors uh, in my backyard. Now, going through the gate, it opens up a whole nother world to me. Uh, there's about 50 acres of mixed woods back there. And I explore it in a lot of different ways. It is, uh, again, a combination of various hardwoods and, again, uh, loblolly pines, as I mentioned. A stream, a small stream does run through it. And, and this is a Johnson County waterfall. You haven't seen one before. It, it is, can be quite beautiful. These are, are large granite boulders. And a little bit deeper into the woods are these larger granite boulders. And actually, if you look at a, a geologic survey map, uh, the Roseville granite batholith. Uh, this is sort of the southern terminus of this, and and that's the same granite that Mitchell Mill State Natural Area is, and town of Roseville has various areas of granite flat rock. So this is the sort of the southern tip of that granite. Beautiful in the landscape there, a resurrection fern covering that large boulder there. Uh, I love the wildflowers, uh, and this is. This is actually on my property here. This is on this side of the stream. Uh, the other person's property is on the other side of that little stream. But the May apples, which come up in March, so I tend to call them March apples. Uh, pinkster flower, uh, one of our native azalea, azaleas bloom along the stream back there. A lot of different diversity, which I can't show you everything. Uh, really nice population of pink lady slippers back in the woods. Uh, one of our native orchids. Uh, again, again, I just enjoy all of this diversity that's back there. Uh, this is a plant uh, called Indian pipes or ghost pipes that actually I didn't see until 2020. I, I assume it was back there previously, but for some reason in 2020, they just showed up everywhere. Uh, when they grow up and the, the, the previous year's uh, flowers look sort of, sort of like you would see it. I don't, I don't know where you see those. Another name for this is corpse flower, and maybe related to how dead those things look. But but this year was 2020. That fall of that year, they were everywhere. And because I hadn't seen them before, I just I surveyed the whole woods and plotted out where they 
where they were occurring. Because again, this, this is the first year that I had come across them. And, and you might say that the, the woods were literally haunted with them. Uh, and I haven't seen them in those numbers since. So I, I have gone in there and seen them. But again, for some reason that year, there was just a, a major uh, uh, you know, eruption of the flowers. And the neat thing about this plant is that it is a flowering plant, uh, but it doesn't produce its own food. It's a mycoheterotroph, which you, you might know that most of our plants, particularly our trees, they, they have a, a relationship with the fungus in the ground. It's called a mycorrhizal relationship, and that actually helps uh, the plant a lot. So it is a mutually beneficial. Well, apparently, these flowering plants, and it isn't a flower right now, the, the flowers at the top, uh, they actually tap into that fungus to get some nutrients from the fungus without really contributing anything to the relationship. So they, they don't hurt anything, but it's sort of, they, they, they literally have tapped into that mycorrhizal relationship between the fungus and the tree species. But anyway, they're really, really cool plants when you see them. I love the mosses and lichens. I can't identify most of them, but that doesn't take away from their beauty, doesn't take away from the role they have in nature and my appreciation of them. Uh, they just, add a lot of wonderful diversity uh, to the to the landscape. Even even on a rotting log, uh, you can find different species of mosses and lichens. Again, uh, I just really love these little mossy lichenscapes, as I call them. Mushrooms, I love mushrooms. Uh, of course, mushrooms are fruiting bodies of the fungus that's usually in the soil or maybe in uh, decaying wood. And again, I'm not really good at identifying many of the mushrooms. But again, uh, I, I enjoy seeing them and appreciating their role in nature. And of course, the role of the mushroom is to release the spores so that they have uh, new new fungi in the, in the, in the, uh, in the area. So it's just a wonderful diversity of, of form and, and texture and everything. So I, I just have lots of photos of these, which we're not gonna go through all 5,000 of them tonight. Again, you just never know where they're going to pop up. And I might mention that September is a great month for mushrooms, particularly if we've had some rain, usually about a week or two after a rain, go in the woods. And September is usually a prime time to find a good variety of mushrooms out in the woods. So I encourage you to do that. All right, the trees. I'm not going to go through all the trees. Uh, this is an umbrella magnolia, which occurs sort of along the, the stream areas. Just a beautiful little tree. Of course, tulip trees or tulip poplars, as people call them are a very common tree, but also just big, beautiful trees produce these big, beautiful flowers that a lot of people don't see until they actually fall out of the tree, unless you really know to look for them. But again, good good tree diversity as you would find you know, right here or pretty much anywhere in this, in this part of the, the state. During the pandemic, I actually, I wrote a, a Nature Now blog and most of my subjects that I wrote about were things that were right either in my yard or in the backwoods. Uh, a lot of interesting subjects that are out there that I just you know, wrote more, more about in this Nature Now blog series. Back to uh, the woods here, I drew in roughly where the streams are. And th these streams are not named, they're intermittent. So this is the you know, beginning of the drainage and the stream actually uh, drains into Beddingfield Creek which drains Clemens Educational State Forest, if you know where that is, and then that runs into the Noose River. So this is, is part of the Noose River drainage system. So, the, so this, the stream is right behind my fence there. And pretty soon after moving in, of course, you know, I'm back there, and, and my son, who was a young teenager then, we're, we're, of course, exploring everything back there. And about that first spring, uh, exploring this little stream here, which, I mean, you can – step across it in many places, so it's not very big, uh, we found this critter, little fish-like critter. Uh, this is a least brook lamprey, which is a native fish, uh, and it's not a well-known fish because most people never see them, even though they actually do occur in the New Centaur River system here. It is a fairly primitive fish. They've been around for a long time. They trace their lineage back to probably about 400 million years ago. So these are cartilaginous fishes, so they, and they're jawless fishes. So they, they appeared on Earth 
before the jawed fishes or before the bony fishes did by, by a long time. And they're still around. They're still very successful. There are are fewer species than the rest, but they still have their niche. Uh, they're very primitive. You can see that they have just a single dorsal fin, single caudal fin. They don't, they don't have paired fins. If you're familiar with the, the freshwater eel, which is a bony fish, you know, they would have paired fins and, and would look very different. Uh, they have a, a sucker-like mouth, and that little protuberance on the top of the nose is actually the nostril for taking in the water to pass through the gill slits for respiration. That allows them to be stuck to a rock. And the genus name is Lampetra, which translates to stone liquor. So they actually will attach to a rock and just anchor themselves, but that allows uh, having the nostril on top of the head allows respiration. Now, this is a photograph of a Leesbrook lamprey from my stream by Scott Smith. Uh, Scott Smith and some others have a North Carolina Fishes uh, website, a wonderful website for, for looking up all of our native fishes. And they've produced this wonderful poster for fishes of the southeastern United States. And my little lamprey is actually on the poster there. So, so anyway, uh, if you like fish, which I know a number of people do, that's a great website to explore the wonderful diversity of fishes that we have, which is, again, just a, a great part of our total aquatic diversity. Now, the Leesbrook lamprey is a member of the northern lampreys, as also the sea lamprey is. And, and most people know the sea lamprey because it's sort of a big, scary thing that's parasitic on fish, which means it attaches to the fish with some pretty scary dental work to rasp away at the flesh, which is not real pleasant for the, for the fish that's attached to. But anyway, the Leesbrook lamprey is a non-parasitic relative within this same family. This is what they look like most of their life. They live about three to five years in the larval form. This is called an amicete. That's uh, just a larval Leesbrook lamprey. Uh, this one I found dead during one of the dry periods when the stream partially dried up and it was just lying on the muck there. Uh, and they don't have fins. They don't even have eyes at this stage. And this, this one, based on the size of being a little over five inches, it was probably going to transform that winter to the adult. But they spend most of their life, the three to five years of their life, in that larval form, buried in the gravel as a filter feeder. So even though you may have a stream right behind your house where these occur, you're not going to see them unless you happen to go out during spawning season. So again, you can see that they're, I mean, most people would not even think that this is a fish. They would probably think that's a really weird-looking worm. But they are really really cool fish they do have a wider distribution in the mississippi drainage system we do have some atlantic coastal plain populations and a specimen from my stream you know when i when i found him in my stream i let the fish people know at the museum and and this is not a, a species that's easy to get a specimen from because they're limited accessibility particularly of the adults and so one of my one of my fishes from my stream actually went to the researchers in Ohio who were doing some DNA work to look at the whole relationship of the least brook lamprey. And even though least brook lamprey are, are you know, more widely distributed in the Mississippi drainage, based on the DNA evidence, partially coming from specimen from my stream, the Atlantic coastal plain populations, that's a more recent occurrence. It's based on what they looked at genetics, they think that this species began populating the Atlantic coastal plain about only about two and a half million years ago. And their theory is that there was probably was some geologic event that caused some streams that originally drained into the Mississippi, shifted over beginning to drain into the, coast, into the Atlantic Ocean, and then they distributed from there. In North Carolina, this is this species is only found in the Noose and Tar River systems. And it is a state threatened species because it does depend on high quality water. And uh, that's something that we have a lot of, we people have a lot of impact on. But you can see that a, uh, these are red dots of, of known locations. And you can see that there's a, a cluster of red dots along the Wake Johnson County line. Matter of fact, where we are right now, uh, 
the stream feeds into the Middle Creek, and Middle Creek is just prime habitat, and they have been documented in there where the creek has not been dammed up and allowed to run free. So, so one of one of those red dots right there is behind my house. Now, it really messed up my view, so I really didn't like that. So I eventually figured out a way to get rid of the red dot, which I did. And uh, once I learned what their pattern was, and again, they spend most of their life in that larva form, three to five years. And then in the fall of the year, when they get big enough, when they're getting close to being big enough to mature, they actually will transform to the adult in the fall, and then they'll just hide out in the stream until something triggers their spawning activity. In, in my stream, that's usually about mid-February, something triggers the spawning activity, and then they all, all the adults come out of hiding and begin their spawning. And it's usually uh, at least two or three uh, males and females, and they do nest building. You know, they, they move rocks around with their mouth. They, they create a lot of action, which in the current of the stream, in essence, creates a nest cavity, which is where they're, and they're going to mate and lay their eggs here. So, so, so when this starts to happen, this is a two to four week period when if they're in your stream, you can just look and see them. They're really easy to see. You might, you may have, you may have not known that they've been living in there for years in the larval form, but when the adults come up, they are very conspicuous. And sometimes you find larger groups. Again, this is right directly behind my house. Uh, they move the rocks around. They, uh, you know, they create this cavity, and eventually the the uh, males, and this, this stimulates spawning, where the male will actually, the female usually will attach to a rock, and the male will come and attach to the rock or attach to the top of her head, and then the spawning happens, where the female is releasing eggs, the male is releasing sperm, and the fertilized eggs drop down into the gravel nest, to hopefully successfully hatch to start the next generation. And when that generation starts, again, it's going to, depending on, I think, depending on how much it can feed in that stream and perhaps environmental conditions, it's going to take about three to five years before that generation will emerge as the next adults some years ago to start this process again. The adults do not eat. They, 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 they basically are there to reproduce and die or get eaten, as you'll actually see in a minute. Once I learned the, the timing of the spawning activity, I began doing daily counts on this stream, just walking my section of stream, which is about 550 feet. Every day that I could, I'd walk it up and down, count all the lampreys, because they're very visible when they're breeding, when they're spawning, they're very visible. So I count lampreys and count the number of nests there. Just a, just a simple survey, just to give an index of what the population is doing. And as most populations do, you often are very cyclic. And the first year that uh, I started, I actually didn't catch the beginning of the season, I don't think. So I, that's why I put an asterisk there. But 2016, that's the highest year I've seen thus far of a high daily count. So that means that even though I was counting for several weeks, there was one day that I counted 43 individual lampreys in my little section of stream. And so that's just an indication. But the next year, 2017, four, the whole season only saw four, the same four, basically. And the the difference here is that Hurricane Matthew came through between that time, and there was a major flooding event in that stream that pretty much scoured everything out. So I think many of the lampreys were, were either killed or just washed downstream. So, so the numbers the next year were very low. They started building back up, and then they dropped off again. Again, there's, you know, this is perhaps natural, according to, again, again for a species that's living three to five years, it's got to weather, literally three to five years of weather events, three to five years of, of droughts and all kinds of things that might affect its ability to survive, to reach, you know, maturity for for the spawning. But anyway, really neat to uh, study this fish, and. Uh, this is Todd Puster, who is a actually a whale biologist and also a well-known wildlife photographer. 
and uh, he found out about the lampreys in my stream. So he came to want to photograph the, the uh, lampreys and he got some wonderful still photographs. And so you can see here better that the, again, the females attached to the rock and the males actually attached to her head or sometimes near the rock. And again, this is all happening in just like a couple of seconds where they both you know, vigorously move. And again, she's expressing the eggs and he's expressing the sperm uh, to, to fertilize the eggs. But, but Todd got some wonderful still photographs and, and uh, this photograph was actually in his article in Wildlife and Magazine in uh, April of 2019, uh, where he was focusing on the aquatic diversity of the coastal plain. So again, a, a really cool fish that uh, most people don't really know that they occur there. Uh, during spawning season, the fish does catch the attention of the predators, which is, which is natural. This is a red-shouldered hawk, and I think that they learn where the lampreys live that yeah, there's going to be some extra food there you know, in early spring. And so I uh, put trail cameras in the stream to, to document what I suspected. And indeed, I've got you know lots of photographs and videos of the red-shouldered hawks jumping in and, and eating the lampreys. And you know, I don't think that they can eat them all. But you know, my hope is that, well, why don't you wait till the lampreys finish doing their thing and then eat them because they're going to die anyway. But I don't know if I can get that through to the hawks or not. But But anyway, the the lampreys are part of the that you know, ecosystem there. That the uh, so they're they're fair game literally for the red-shouldered hawks. Now that's just a really short snapshot. If you want to learn more about the lamprey, I encourage you to go to the Department of Environmental Quality's website and look up their lunchtime discovery series. Uh, in January, Michael Fisk with the Wildlife Commission, uh, he teamed up with me to do a program about the lampreys for. For many years early on, I was the only one that was surveying lampreys in North Carolina. Uh, even though it's a state threatened species, uh, they don't even have a management plan for it. So, so Michael Fisk is actually a husband of a staff person of mine. Uh, so he, he teamed up with what I was doing. And so the state has now done two years of a more extensive survey in the News and Tar River system to map out this state threatened species to try to see what recommendations they will have with regard to their management. And of course, the short answer to that is you manage the water systems that we have and you protect them. And that's 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 what these need. As long as we have those clear running streams with that sand gravel substrate, then these things will probably do okay. But but as you know, those are streams that often don't survive uh, a lot of our activities. Box turtles. Changing the subject again. I'm I'm actually going through four subjects that actually I do an hour long program on each of those. So I'm trying to watch my time here and try to <laughs> two hours left. <laughs> okay. All right. Box turtles. I love box turtles and, and Jackie, I know you love box turtles from your work in the park and everything, but they, they are literally gems of the forest. They are an aquatic uh, turtle, but they are our most terrestrial of our aquatic turtles. So they have a developed in a terrestrial lifestyle and they're, you know, they're, uh, you know, just about everywhere in the woods. And about 15 years ago, I began systematically documenting the box turtles in the woods near my house, in my neighborhood. And, oops, I'm back too far. And this is just 36 of the individual turtles of 50 plus that I've identified thus far. And you can see that the shell pattern of the turtles is unique like a fingerprint. Now, some researchers who do bigger studies than what I'm doing, they'll actually catch the turtles and they'll they'll file, file a little notch in the side of the, the shell there to give it a code. But I just use photography. I take photographs of all the turtles. I actually weigh it, measure them, uh, uh, take a GPS reading, uh, and then I release them. And then I keep a photo file. Matter of fact, I've got this photo file on my phone so that when I find another turtle, I can quickly look up and look up the image bank I have and see whether this is a new turtle or a turtle that I've seen before. And then I can go into my spreadsheet and see the whole history of that turtle. But anyway, this is something you can do if you're not already doing it. Do it if you have turtles in your neighborhood. You know, th these are very long lived turtles. You know, they can live over 100 years old. So if you do this, and particularly if you upload that information to a citizen science uh, websites such as Herp Mapper or iNaturalist, then that becomes a permanent record that somebody could probably go into later and, 
And yeah, if you go back and, or somebody goes and finds that turtle 50 years later, they might can reference to when you first saw them 50 years earlier. But anyway, I thought I would sort of test your knowledge tonight or your observation skills to see how this system works in identifying individual box turtles. So I have nine photographs of eight different box turtles. So all you have to do is compare the photographs and pick the two photographs that are of the same turtle. And I made it pretty easy here. So just feel free to, 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 to yell out the, the two numbers that you think it is. What, what did I hear? Two and six? Two and six, not. Uh, I got, so what? Two and eight? Two and six? Five, Five and three. Well, this this one was supposed to be pretty easy, and actually, I think I heard somebody say the right number a while ago. anybody anybody really sure of their answer? Pardon? Nine and four. So the 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 interesting thing is that if you're if you're trying to pick the identical the same photograph, these two photographs were taken ten years apart. <laughs> so you had to focus on the pattern of the turtle. So I first saw and documented this turtle uh, in the, the cul-de-sac of my neighborhood crossing in 2010. And I didn't see it again actually until this spring. Uh, but my neighbor saw it in 2020. And my neighbors know what I do, so they help me. So if they see a turtle in their yard, they'll take a photograph and say, you know, send it to me and say, Jerry, this turtle crossed in my yard. And, and then I can look it up. So, so indeed, I, that turtle that I first documented in, in 2010, my next door neighbor, documented in 2020 and again i have documented again this year so it's, it's just great I, I get a lot of satisfaction knowing that that turtle's still doing well in my neighborhood I mean, that's just 13 years which is a short time frame for a turtle that can live 100 years but but i'm just glad that they can uh still still make it so so i've got some other turtles and again again you can see you can you don't have to look at the whole shell pattern just one scoop you can focus on just one scoop and see how identical they are. And you can go to another scoop if you want to. But anyway, there once you observe, you can pretty easily identify the individual turtles based on that shell pattern. And this is the turtle that actually started in 2008 uh, that, that I, I think I found more than any other turtle over the years. I found it in two, and, and, and this is, this turtle probably ranged further than this. So this is partially an artifact that I spend more time right behind my house than in other parts. But box turtles have been documented to have a fairly small home range, you know, like one to five acres, maybe somewhere in that range, depending on where they're living. And so this turtle uh, I found uh, several times, uh, first in 2008, then in 2011, 12, 13. Then there was, you know, four-year gap until 2017. And then the last time I, I, I saw this turtle was in 2020. And so it's about due for it to show up again. I'm just keeping my fingers crossed that it will. I'll, I'll worry about these animals, that something happens to them, which it does sometimes. But I just hope that, that they do make it through there. Now, most of my wildlife observing, I don't do directly. I actually do with a trail camera. And if you haven't learned how to use a trail camera, I encourage you to do, to do that because that can really open up uh, your world in terms of observing wildlife. Uh, this this is one of the more interesting shots I got. And, and again, during lamprey season, I was putting trail cameras focused on the stream just to catch the lamprey predators. And I just caught this really cool shot of a flying coyote. Did you know fly, coyotes could fly? Uh, and I, yeah, I've used different trail cameras over the years, and this is one I borrowed from the museum that actually had a white flash. So that's why I got a full color image. And I, and I do see coyotes. I mean, coyotes are statewide. They come through the woods behind my house on a you know on an occasional basis. They're not back there all the time, but they're they're part of the landscape. And and I actually welcome as part of our megafauna because they're they're filling a niche, you know, that was made vacant by our removal of wolves, our removal of the mountain lion. So so I'm 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 you know, I know some people are worried about coyotes in the neighborhood, but I'm, I'm fine with it. You know. So anyway. You can't do anything about it if you're not fine with it. Anyway, uh, of course, deer, everybody has deer, and there's nothing cuter than you know, a doe and her fawn. And again, this is, they just came up from the stream, 
and and they are actually all my property. So this was all my property here, and 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 don't think cuter than than this is perhaps two fawns coming. So I, I enjoy seeing them. Uh, at, you know, and, if, and, if, and you might recognize that's Japanese silk grass back there, which is something we don't we don't want because it is invasive and it takes over. And I, I was really encouraged when I saw that little fawn nibbling on it. I said, eat more, eat more. I just wish deer would start eating more Japanese steel grass, and that would really take care of a lot of things for us. Now, this is your first view of the possum hole, and you're going to hear a lot about the possum hole. And yes, the buck stops at the possum hole. And uh, so this this is just taken, you know, in August of this year, so this time of year, you know, the, the bucks have, have antlered up, and they'll, they'll, they'll soon be... Uh, you know, engaging each other. And not, not only did one buck stop here, but two bucks stopped here. So again, it's just sort of sort of interesting to watch the wildlife. And I do keep all of my cameras in video mode because I, you know, I don't want to just see a still picture. I like seeing what they do. I like seeing their behavior. So I always leave it in video mode, even though I've got to watch a lot of videos of, of gray squirrels doing what gray squirrels do. Now here's a nice palm turkey i mean he is strutting his stuff there and earlier in the year i actually got a whole flock of turkeys coming through here and it was really cool that we had a whole flock of turkeys who were roaming around the yards and all it's so cool to see them and, and i so welcome seeing the you know the the wild turkey back as fairly common in our natural landscape i think that that's been a conservation success story to get them back in the landscape Yes, got gray squirrels, and, and I usually just have to go through all these clips of gray squirrels, but I want you to watch this clip real carefully. Uh, see if you, did you see, what was that? Did you see what happened? Something flew over, but that, I mean, that the trigger was a little slow on that second clip, but something flew over and after that gray squirrel. So the gray squirrel comes back out to check things out again. Which, whoop, there. Now you can see what, what he was running from. He just happened to be at the possum hole. Squirrels don't live in the possum hole, but they play around it. And that gave that squirrel a safe place to duck when that red-tailed hawk swooped down to get him. Of course, you know, I feel sorry that the red-tailed hawk didn't get a meal, but they'll get a, he'll get another chance. And barred owls. You know, I hear barred owls in the woods back there all the time. I don't often get them during the daytime, but, but they do feed on crayfish. Yeah, you know, so this one swooped down and got a crunchy crayfish snack for the day there. And so it's really, really cool to, to see this. And, I, you know, I, you know, again, I catch all kinds of things of this. And I, I do move the cameras around uh, with the exception of the possum hole, which I'll talk about in a minute. Great blue herons come through. So, so again, it's just a great way to enjoy wildlife. And the neat thing is that you're not there. You say, well, that's not neat. What's well, neat because then the animal is not scared. So you see the animal doing what it would normally do when it's not scared that something is posing a threat to it. So I encourage you to consider, you know, I'm, probably many of you have binoculars. You should have trail cameras where you can deploy them and observe the wildlife. Uh, I hear pileated woodpeckers back there, but this is the only footage I ever got of a pileated woodpecker on a trail camera, which is really cool to see and and I'm, I'm still waiting for the ivory bill to show up and and you'll you'll hear about that when when that happens okay the pos the, the possum hole and i'm you know i'm watching the clock too so i might have to go a little fast here the possum hole uh in january of 2020 us us you know you know exploring the woods i saw that there was a hole here that was being used by some animal now this is, hole was created by a white oak tree that was partially pushed over by some windstorm and the root ball just sort of lifted up, created a cavity underneath it, and an animal started taking advantage of that. And when I first discovered it, I wasn't sure what animal it was. So I put a trail camera there to see what it was. And it was Mr. Big Head, as I started calling this opossum, which is the male opossum. Male opossums tend to have a, a big head. And I first put the camera there. It was on New Year's Day, 2020. And when I saw a possum was there, I said, oh, this is cool. I think I'll start watching this possum for a while and learn about 
the opossum. And of course, most of what I learned is that possums go in and out of the hole. But they do other things outside the hole. And again, it's in video mode, so I start seeing the behavior. And possums they are very underappreciated and not well stood. They are a very common animal, but there are so many cool things about opossums. And I learned a lot by watching these videos. So I pretty much have become a possum preacher. So that's why you're here tonight. But this possum hole is less than 300 feet from my back door. And possums, wherever you live, you probably have a possum living near you, whether you know it or not. They're, they're very common. They're very adaptable. Uh, they do. They're quite successful. And in spite of the large numbers of them you see killed on the roads, they are doing well. Uh, but but they are neat animals to have. You should welcome your to your neighborhood because they do lots of good things and are an important part of nature out there. But anyway, what surprised me that first year, because I thought I was just going to be watch, watching a, an individual possum come and go and do whatever else it was doing there. But during that first year, I ended up watching eight different opossums. And it ended up being four males and four females. And they're not in the hole at the same time. One will be in it for a while, then that one will go somewhere else, another one will be in it. And even when they're not in the hole, all these other possums are coming by and visiting the hole and checking it out. And so it's almost like that the community center for opossums. And so I had to come up with a system to identifying opossum because, you know, opossums sort of all look alike. So I came up with a char various characteristics. Uh, first of all, male and females, when they're going into the hole, it's pretty easy to tell what sex they are, but then their ear markings, uh, males tend to have a you know much bigger head uh, and other markings that I, I sort of came up with a system to identify these individual opossums, and I have an Excel spreadsheet to keep up with all of it. But so I, so I became a possum observer, and I've got three and a half years of videos that you're not going to see it all tonight. But anyway, this allowed me to see some of the behavior of that possum. And again, most people, if you if you encounter a possum, it's just going to be it's just going to be scared of you. So you're not going to see their natural wild behavior. So this is scent marking. This is a male, and they have to have a scent gland in their chest. And so they they wipe saliva on this beech tree. They rub their chest on it. So he's leaving his scent on this beech tree, and they and they do it around the edge of the of the possum hole too, just outside it. And then females will come along and rub their scent in it too, or get in the scent. Perhaps they're getting the scent from the male on them. Now, now this this is one of the females, I think this was Mama too. She loved that Christmas fern. Every time she came by that Christmas fern, she would rub in that fern. You, you might say she was rather fond of that fern. But anyway, I, I'm you know, even though opossums are primarily nocturnal, they are active sometime during the daytime. So I'm so glad for that because we can get some, I can get some better video during the daytime. And of all the things that possums do, this is the coolest thing in the world. They have a prehensile tail. They can use that for climbing, as an aid in climbing, but they also use it to carry stuff like leaves. They don't want to sleep on the mud. So they will go and they will gather up leaves. And again, this is all video from a daytime, but they will just, cart the leaves in there and and this is a you know, combination of different clips but usually when they decide it's time to, to update the possum hole they'll bring about eight different loads of leaves into there at a time and uh, both the males and females do it so, so, so again it's just really cool to watch and so i've got got lots of video of them doing this i didn't know how they gathered the leaves until i got this video I mean, I, just, I kept trying to figure out how do they get the leaves in their tail. But this video, you can see that this is a female opossum. She grabs the leaves with her mouth, moves them to her front feet, then moves them to the hind feet, and then hind feet moves them to the tail that's curled up to grab a hold of them. So until I saw this video, I kept trying to figure out, okay, how are they getting those leaves? And so I'm glad that I finally, well, I didn't figure it out, but I saw how they did it. So again, really cool to see this behavior. And I don't know how else you would see this except with a remote trail camera. Now, this is another thing about opossums. They, they are marsupials. 
I assume you know, knew that. Matter of fact, this is North America's only marsupial. So like kangaroos, they, they carry their young in a pouch. And, well, this one's pouch is sort of overflowing. Uh, she's, this female's going into the second possum hole, and I'm not sure she's going to fit in there. She's pretty well loaded with, with joeys, and that's what baby uh, possums are called. They're called joeys. Uh, she can barely make it out. But anyway, uh, the possums in our area usually have two uh, litters a year, uh, a spring one and then a summer one. Uh, in other parts of the country, they may only have one. But they, they produce, uh, they can have up to 13 in, in their pouch at a time. And the only limitation there is that they only have 13 teats to nurse with. Uh, and in a, other, another interesting thing about the opossum, and again, I do a whole other program about this, uh, they have the shortest gestation period of any mammal in the world. It's like 12 to 13 days from conception to birth. And when they're born, they look like little, they're about the size of a bumblebee. And that little hairless thing has to crawl up the belly to get into the pouch to attach to one of just 13 uh, teats to continue development. And they may have up to 20 young. So it's only the first 13 that make it and get attached that are going to make it, and, and in, in most cases, probably there are fewer in there. Uh, that's probably that's just the maximum that they can have. But again, just really cool. And when they're too big for the pouch, they'll ride on the back. And of course, there's some there's some hanging out of her pouch too. But again, there's just so many cool things, and I just yeah, I've enjoyed uh, watching these opossums over the years, and I'm still watching them now. And I rarely see different interactions so here's a a possum going to cross on the log and a raccoon wasn't going to have anything to do with it so just sort of back the uh a possum down and and that was well i thought that was going to be the end of it but then the and and this is a normal gait for an opossum just grudge along and the possum said well i'll just go under the log to get where i'm going to go and the uh the raccoon's going to come back some for some reason the raccoon didn't like the opossum there and and this, that's what a, an opossum normally do, does when it's threatened. It'll just turn around and open its mouth and hiss at you. And they actually have the most teeth of any North American land mammal. They have 50 teeth in their mouth. And they are omnivores, so they eat a variety of small animals and plant material. But they're really, really cool animals. And now this next clip, you're going to have to watch really quick. And I have no explanation for it. All right, I'm going to see if I can play that again. Just go back one perfect. Yeah, let me do that. All right, there we go. So I've only got a three second clip. So I don't know what happened before. I don't know what happened after. But all I get is a possum running full speed. I've never seen a possum run before. So I saw that running full speed chasing a raccoon. I don't know what's going on. So that's one of the mysteries that we'll we'll never know about. Then then this happened. This was last year. And here's a gray fox. And this this is a male opossum. He just wants to cross the log, cross the stream. But the Mrs. Gray Fox doesn't want that. So for some reason, she didn't want him crossing the log. And this is a female. Uh, the male fox is nearby. And he, and he jumps up to check on things. And, and I, I called him Hoppy because his right foot looks like it was injured or maybe misformed at some point. He, he's fine, but he, hop, he hops when he runs along. So... So they did not want that opossum crossing that log. And I think I know why now. And of course, yeah, I'm seeing all this usually two weeks after it happens. So because so, I, you know, I, I get the memory card out, I put a new one in, and, and again, it's about a two-week uh, difference there. Well, the next day, uh, this site is about 100 feet away from the possum hole. So the next day, this happens at the possum hole. This is that that's that same female fox that tried to pull that big male possum off the log 
And again, I, I've, I've spliced this, so she just put two kits into the possum hole. But the possum is still in there. This is a female possum that was in the hole. And of course, the, 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 fox, the fox is out right now, but, but she comes out, and I can only imagine what she's saying is like, what in the world is going on? Who, what are these fuzzy things in my hole? Was I dreaming that? Well, maybe so. I think I'll just go back in the hole. Surely, surely I didn't, I didn't see what just happened. So the female opossum goes back into the hole, and then the mother fox brings the third kit, and then the fourth kit. So she, so yeah, I think the reason why they pulled. She didn't want the opossum going where that big male opossum going. Probably where her kits were over there, uh, and apparently they were moving their kits, and so they decided to move them to the opossum hole. And they just sort of took up home there. And again, the female opossum is still in the hole at this point. I don't know what's going on in the hole. I wish I had. I wish I had a camera in there. And they, they're so darn cute. I mean, these gray foxes are just so cute. And again, I don't know this is happening. You know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm 280 feet away in my house. I have no clue this is all going on in the woods behind my house until, until I look at their memory card two weeks later. So these little boogers, they played so much outside the possum hole that they ate up my memory card. So later this afternoon, I got the last video of the possum hole until I put a new card in there. So I lost eight days of video. I don't know what happened in those eight days. So when I finally got a card in there, the Fox family had moved on. I haven't seen the female opossum since then. I took a GoPro camera to see if she was in the hole, uh, you know, may, where she might've been you know, predated by the Fox and I didn't find any sign of her. So I don't know the circumstances but, or even when the family of foxes left and how the female opossum left. So anyway, I guess that's just a mystery. Uh, but I did, do have lots of great footage of little little baby foxes uh, playing outside the hole. So, so there are always those surprises that are, that are out there. And uh, just to sort of sum up opossums, uh, I, I love opossums. I mean, they're such cool animals. They do a lot of great things for us, you know. They eat insects. Uh, they eat ticks. They don't eat the number of ticks that some people claim they do. They eat venomous snakes. Uh, they they're immune to the venom of our venomous snakes. So if you if you don't want copperheads around, then it's sort of good to have these around because they will will kill and eat them. It's really underappreciated, misunderstood animals that people should welcome them in their neighborhood. And again, I do a whole program on this. As a matter of fact, I did the program for the island chapter of the wildlife. North Carolina Wildlife Federation last year. So a wonderful resource is to go online for the Wildlife Federation. And you can look at all these archive programs. So if you want to get the, the full story on the opossums, uh, please go there and watch that recording. And of course, you, know, you can watch this recording later. But again, I'm, I'm trying to catch the highlight without taking too much of your time. All right. One more story to tell. I think that's all I've got. A ghost story. M many of you if you go to the mountains, you perhaps have heard about the firefly displays that, I mean, people, you know, they enter lotteries to try to get to see these firefly displays. And there are two species that are target species, the, the synchronous fireflies and then the blue ghost firefly. They're two different species that often when they're displaying together, it's just a magical sight in our mountains. And the blue ghost firefly, we actually have, a ghost firefly in the Piedmont of North Carolina. Uh, Dr. Clyde Sorensen, professor of entomology at NC State, he found out about a population of blue ghost fireflies in Chatham County. And, and he looked at the specimens. They, they actually wouldn't let him take a specimen because they were so protective of those fireflies, they wouldn't let them, you know, take one. Uh, but he looked at them and he thought they looked different from the mountain blue ghost firefly. So he's suspecting this is a undescribed species of ghost firefly. And he thought surely they occur in other parts. Surely they don't, they don't only occur in one site. So he thought they should be elsewhere. 
So he, he checked around in other parts of Chatham County, and indeed he did find start finding some additional populations of them. And he was he was using I'm I'm a friend of his, and I'm also a Facebook friend of his. And so he was putting the word out for all of us nature lovers. Yeah, you know, please help us look for the Piedmont ghost firefly, because uh, you know we'd like to find out more about this undescribed species. So he. He reported that he found he found additional populations in Chatham County and a couple more in Wake County. Uh, so, so he he said, hey, "Surely there's more out there." And I and I had a Facebook discussion with him because you know you know I live in Johnson County, just across the Wake County line. Matter of fact, I only live a mile from Dr. Clyde Sorensen, so he lives very close to me. So on Facebook, I said, "Well, you think you think we should look around here? You know, and." Uh, you know, thinking about, well, if they occur in Wake County, they might occur in Johnson County. So, again, this is a Facebook guy said, sure, yeah, be, it'd be worth looking. Uh, so about a week passed, and I didn't look. But he posted, any luck? And I didn't want to admit to him that I hadn't really looked for the fireflies. So I, I didn't lie to him, but I said, well, you would have known if I had. <laughs> and, you know, and this was a, a weekend night, and I think I was watching something on Netflix, and I'd had a couple of beverages and uh i felt really bad about that response well i didn't lie to him but i didn't really tell him the whole truth okay it's about the right time of the evening let me go grab a red flashlight i'm going to go back to those woods back there just so i can see that there are no fireflies back there so that's what i did i grabbed a flashlight and i put on my boots and crossed the stream and started walking up the hill to the woods right behind my house and i thought i saw a little blue flash a little blue light did I really see that? How many of those beverages did I have? And then I looked up the hill, and there were about almost two dozen little faint blue lights sort of sort of dancing on top of the hill. So I had found blue, the Piedmont formed a blue ghost firefly right behind my house when I finally did take, go and take a look for him. I could not believe it. Of course, I contacted him that night, and he was very excited about that. And... Uh, uh, Dr. Sorensen is an entomologist, uh, a firefly expert, and after my success, he went and looked in the woods behind his house, and he had them behind his house too, but after living 20 years in that house, he had never gone out to look for them. <laughs> so we, we both laugh at ourselves about that, and that just lets you know how cryptic a species might be, a species that not even been described through science. So again, that's the little star for me finding them first in Johnson County. Uh, and we actually launched the Carolina Ghost Hunt website. This is a citizen science project because we can't be everywhere. And this is a limited window of time. It's about a, a roughly mid-April to mid-May is when they're flying for mating. So we're trying to get people, and this is where you can help too because that may be right in the woods behind your house or woods near you, we want you to look for these. So we've got a website that you can go in and learn more about this, this firefly. And indeed, in 2022, we found them pretty widely in Wake County and, and some of the North Carolina Wildlife Federation members of the Noose River chapter helped look in Forest Ridge Park, places like that. So they're in Forest Ridge Park, they're in Lake Johnson Woods, they're in uh, uh, Durant Park and a number of other places. They may well be here in Bass Lake Park, and they just need those woods. And you need to know how to look for them, which you know the you can go on the website and learn more about them. So, uh, in 2023, you know I went in Randolph County in, in a couple of spots, and we're starting to fill in the gaps. And you might notice that well, there's a big gap there in Southern Wake County. Yeah, I wish I knew a group that was based in Southern Wake County that might go out and look for these things. So, so you're in prime area uh, for the firefly. And so if you're interested, please help us in the firefly hunt uh, next year, again, mid April to mid May. And, and they're not really bright fireflies. They're not stupid. They're just not really bright in terms of the light lighting up. So that's why they, they're not really bright like the, the ones that are, are in your backyard. So you have to go out in total darkness and you have to let your eyes accustom and, the, and, 
and they stay lit. Uh, the female, matter of fact, well, this, this, is where, this is where they live in the woods behind my house. So nothing special about the woods, just mixed woods. These are the adults, which are about about the size of a rice grain. These are the adult females. The adult females are larval form. They retain the larval characteristics. And this is what you look for. They wear right there. They, again, this, this female is the size of a rice grain and they only live a year. So the female, uh, she's been in the ground all this time since hatching out of the egg the previous year feeding on various little critters and then when it's her time when she's matured she comes up to the top of the leaf litter and sticks her little rear in the air and lights up and she stays lit i've seen a female stay lit for up to an hour but it's a very dim it's a green light but because it's so dim it looks sort of bluish to us but they just stay lit so if you're eyes are adjusted you can see them and they will stay there for a while and of course she's advertising you know hey baby i'm over here you know so that the males uh they also stay lit continuously for like up to a minute and flying so they gradually come in and uh find the female and they will mate with her and uh uh both the male and female, they die after the mating. The female actually stays with the eggs for a little while, uh, sort of protects the eggs, but eventually she will die. And, and the male also, uh, they don't live beyond that year. But just a really cool firefly that, you know, I never, you know, a, a, an undescribed species in the woods behind my house. Who, who knows what other things are in these woods, you know, to discover. And and I and I really do worry about these little patches of woods because, as you know, we tend to lose those pretty quickly in a, in a permanent way. So I'm hoping that, you know, I always hope that we can find ways to to preserve these natural areas, even if they're small, uh, in public ownership or private ownership. I just hope that we can always have room for the wildlife because I've really learned over my 20 years of living here. You know, who my who all my neighbors are and i hope that those woods will be there when i'm gone i hope the people that move into this house when i'm gone will be equally wildlife friendly as i am and will allow the spiders and the snakes and the lizards and the frogs all to have safe residence there uh, and i know that you are of the same mind in terms of you appreciate wildlife and even though you don't have to like all the wildlife, uh, you certainly should appreciate the role of everything has in that whole complex uh, web of nature. So that is totally the end, and I didn't go too far over. Uh, so I think we have time for questions, and thank you so much for not falling asleep and um, staying with me. All right, John. Thank you. you know, we're gonna we're gonna do this with microphones. So let me uh, okay. get us in. First right. of all, I want to say you have this. You have captivated this audience. Okay. I can tell you. Okay. Well, we don't you. want story time to end. <laughs> <laughs> this was great. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take questions now. Yeah. Okay. We're gonna take questions now, and I need a volunteer to pass the microphone around. You want to do it? Over here. And I did put up. Two websites, which which I think are also also on the website or on on the, on the Zoom chat about uh, where to find the archive videos for North Carolina Wildlife Federation, and also to find the archive videos of the Lunchtime Discovery Series by the Office of Environmental Education. What argument would you make in terms of, I know you mentioned, you know, every species has its value, which I totally agree with. We have a lot of cockroaches, especially at night. I mean, I like them, but uh, what argument would you make if somebody came up and said, you know, we have to get rid of all these terrible bugs? 
Well, you know, if you're talking about cockroaches in your house, I'm I'm okay with getting rid of those, uh, with what you need. But 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 the the the, the native roaches that are outside of uh, the wood roaches and all that's all part of nature and and i i don't want to introduce a pesticide outside that some of our might affect some of our native species so uh yeah I, I, sometimes it's hard to reason with someone in terms of why they shouldn't want to you know spray all around the house just because they've seen some cockroaches i mean i i put up with a lot of things and you know uh, i don't i don't have an easy answer to that except to try to impress upon them that insects, insect diversity is so important to us. Yeah, you know, even if you don't care about the insects, we depend on those insects. I mean, uh, the, that whole web of life, uh, the birds that you like, a lot of them eat insects. And again, you, you can't do away with one group of animals without it affecting all the groups of animals. And we're one of those groups of animals. Do you have king snakes in your backyard? Well, uh, I have seen a mole king snake. I haven't seen the eastern king snake, but I have seen a mole king snake, which is which is a really cool king snake. And king snakes in general are very cool. Here, you go. Uh, we'll hand with it. Wait for the microphone. The remote people won't hear. Possums have like a scream or something, a loud. You know that the only, the only vocalization I've ever heard uh, is sort of almost sort of a hissing sound. Uh, there, there may be some people who who rehabilitate opossums, and there are a whole group of people, great people, who will take injured and orphaned opossums and raise them up, and they may be better able to answer that question. I don't think they vocalize much more than just simply maybe a clicking or a hissing sound at times, but I've never heard them on the on on the videos. So let's talk briefly about engagement with your neighbors. So what was the process like when you first started growing up that area of your grass in the front yard? What conversation did you have with your neighbors? And then when you told your neighbors, hey, I'm photographing these box turtles or whatever, how did you get them on board with that process? Well, well, my neighbors learned pretty quickly that I'm a nature nerd. Uh, and, and one of my neighbors really doesn't like snakes. But I finally got him to warm up the snakes so that instead of killing everything, he would either send me a picture or call me over to see what it is. And even with copperheads now, if he finds a copperhead, he'll give me a chance uh, to come over and I'll do a minor relocation of the copperhead without sacrificing the copperhead. Uh, with all the other snakes, it's just, even though he doesn't like them, as long as he knows it's not a copperhead, he is much more tolerant of them. So so they've all learned that I do these strange things with the animals and and they, and they and I mean, the, you know, people in general are good. And if, and if they recognize that, you know, this is something that, uh, you know, I mean, animals are animals. You should treat them with respect and kindness. And, and so they look out for them and, and everything. And I, I know I had one neighbor who had some guests over for a party and they get one of the guests just accidentally ran over a box turtle in the yard, which they felt so bad about. And they, no one knew the turtle was there. And so, so they are all on board. Uh, my neighborhood doesn't have an active, homeowners association so we sort of can do whatever we want to in the neighborhood so i you know i did the jerry prayer i made it nice and neat i did a rectangular size but that probably wouldn't fly in some other places but but you know as you know we we need to we need to get away from this having just huge areas of mowed grass i mean that is just a resource waste there so the less grass you can have and put things in its place for the wildlife, the better off. So I don't know. It's just sort of trying to win them over, change their attitude a little bit. And again, I just have good neighbors who were pretty, pretty easy to convince, I think. And yes. Let's say that you're going to have to deal with like a venomous snake from like your neighbor's yard. Do you have like a snake stick or do you just pick them up by hand? I never pick up a venomous snake by hand. Uh, some people do, but you're asking for trouble. <laughs> so, so yes. Uh, so, I, I mean, I grew up catching frogs and turtles and lizards and snakes. So I actually know how to catch venomous snakes. And, and I catch them with what's called a snake hook. And it's not a hook that impels them, but you just gently pick them up and you can put them in a container 
and then close the container, and that's how I relocate them. That's so, what I thought, like the snake stick thing. Yep, yep, you... exactly. So I, I never put my hands on a snake, and I'm real even careful doing that. Yeah, many snake bites occur when people are trying to catch or kill a snake. Uh, the best thing to do if you see a snake that is venomous or you, you're not sure, stay away from it. You know, then it's a completely harmless snake as long as you stay away from it. So that's the best thing. Just leave it alone. And they usually will go away and go do their thing. There's a question way over there. Okay. Um, so we already get a lot of fireflies on our yard. Do you know if the blue ghost fireflies co-mingle with other species? Like, would we be able to see both? It, it's possible that, uh, of course, fireflies are, are flashing at different times. The blue ghost is an earlier one. So again, in our area, it's about mid-April to mid-May is when we think that they're doing their flight pattern that's that's usually a little bit earlier than others but when when i when i go look for the blue ghost i go stand in the woods in the dark you know and sometimes i do see some of the other fireflies come through the woods but most of the other more common fireflies that i see they prefer my open yard as opposed to the woods but i do see some of the others so it is possible to see some different species but again the blue ghost is not going to be bright it's not going to be flashing. It's just going to be a continuously lit light. So, so once you see them, it's pretty easy to identify. Them. And one thing I, I forgot to mention when I showed you the image, the mountain blue ghost, which is a described species, uh, when you and again they're really really small, but if you get close enough with a magnifier, you can see that 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 female uh, has about six light organs on her body. This Piedmont ghost only has two light organs on the tip of her tail. So that is distinguishing them from this new species. But but yeah, you can you can see some others at the same time, but usually they're somewhat a little bit separated by both timing and by place of where they're lighting. Jerry, we have a couple online questions. Um it's hard to find them with all the compliments about your shirt. So, <laughs> so thank you, everybody. <laughs> Anne has a question. She is wondering, uh, how how do I convince my grandson that the granddaddy spiders in our house have a purpose and he shouldn't want to kill them? I took my grandson to the spider exhibit at the museum, but he still doesn't like them. He is bigger than them. He shouldn't be scared. That, 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 that's tough. And and uh, yeah, we do have a spider exhibit at the museum, which is a great exhibit, by the way. But your know, spiders, I mean, a lot of people's reaction to a spider is to squish it. I mean, that's just a reaction. And that is so unthinking because spiders are important predators in our world they're they're, they're a very diverse group uh, there are very few spiders that are going to hurt you and even if you get creeped out by this animal with eight legs well so what i mean get get over it and understand that it's there for a reason i mean i have spiders in my house uh actually in the house and you know i just give them you know, fair passage. They set up little webs in some of my windows and they catch some of the other bugs that are in my house. But it's just, it is a, I don't know, uh, we've, we've been taught to be scared of spiders and snakes and bats and things of that nature that we, we find a little bit creepy. It's just sort of breaking down that barrier and recognizing this is a really cool animal. I mean, go, go look up some of the jumping spiders. They are really cool animals and do some really neat things. Now, of course, Daddy Longlegs is not a spider. It's in, it's, 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 it is an arthropod, but it's in a totally different group. But a lot of people think that they're spiders, and there are other myths about the Granddaddy Longlegs that it's supposedly the most venomous thing in the world, which it's not. But anyway, I, I like the live and let live philosophy of, you know, yeah, yeah, maybe you don't want some things in your house. If you can, just gently catch it and put it outside and just uh, know that it's not there to hurt you. It's just trying to make a living as best it can. And, and I think we just need to be more tolerant of animals, you know, that don't look like the cute little fuzzy animals that we have as pets. I'm not sure if I answered that, but that's the best I can do. <laughs> yeah. The wildlife Federation with snakes in particular, we're really trying to reverse the, get the shovel mentality. So, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, so one more question online, this one's from Deborah and I like this question a lot. So Jerry, when you're outside, just taking a casual hike in the woods, 
What do you think about? I, I, I'm just enjoying being out in the woods. And so I'm, I'm usually thinking about, well, what am I going to see around this little next bend? Or if I'm walking along the creek, what might I see? So I'm always looking for stuff. I'm looking for, you know, not just the big stuff. I'm looking for, you know, a little lichen or a little mushroom or little millipede crawling. So I don't know. I just, uh, I just get great pleasure in, in uh, being observant enough to notice some things in nature. And I just feel that, you know, my life is much more fulfilling because I do get that joy. And, and I do wish that more people would take the time to look. I mean, look, some, some people go on a hike. They don't look. Their hike is a physical activity. Other people, uh, you know, do take the time to look and you just need to be more observant. And so I just, I just, uh, really enjoy the surprises that I find you know, when I'm out in the woods. And, uh, I just get a lot of joy out of that. And, I enjoy sharing that with people. So I do lead hikes, you know, I'm out there alone by myself and I'm get a lot of self enjoyment doing that, but I really enjoy showing something to somebody, uh, somebody that maybe just didn't quite know to, to look in that little, little hollow area of the log to look for something in there. So I really like turning sort of changing people's perception to really start looking and look at how wonderful this diversity of life, big life and small life is on this world. And, and I, and that, that's what I try to impart on my hikes because I, I think if you know it's there and you appreciate it, uh, you don't have to love it. As long as you appreciate its role, then then that's going to make you respectful of life, and, and we need more people to have that respect. Yeah, we have a uh, platform probably pretty close to the size of that table on a tall tree uh, way above our house. Uh, it's made out of sticks and leaves. It's still here after having all those heavy rains. Uh, it's obviously some type of nest. Uh, we also hear barred owls mm -hmm. uh, at night. So does that sound like a barred owl nest or what would you think? Uh, I've never seen a barred owl nest. So I, I, don't, I don't think they would nest on a platform, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure. The platform over water? Oh, okay. Oh, so when you say platform, it's not a it's not a constructive platform. I don't know. You know. It's something you may just have to try to keep an eye on different times of the year to see if you can see who's using it or who's putting sticks up there. But I I, I don't know. Yeah, we have red-shouldered hawks and barred owls in, in near our yard. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I've never seen any nest in the woods behind my house at the time that I'm walking through there. I've just never seen the nest. Uh, so, 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 so I don't know. I just, just they, wanted they to also out. add, you know, we, we talked earlier about some of the negative things. But just recently, in fact, this week, President Biden uh, went ahead and approved the protection of thousands of acres of land up in Alaska that was under threat from development. They well, that, wanted to pass that on. Well, that's great. Great. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, John. Good. I think we've got time for one more question. Just wondering how if your your stream has water all year round or or if it's intermittent with the it, rain. It's intermittent. It is intermittent. Yeah. You know, and that means a stream is inter intermittent is one that during times of dry, it will dry up. So you know, in my 20 years of living there, there have been maybe about four or five years scattered in there where I've been back there and it's actually dried down to where there are puddles or something. Uh, and, you know, even though you might not see surface water, you know, it's probably some water still there. And I always wondered how the, how the lamprey larvae survive that. And maybe sometimes they don't like, I found that dead one. Uh, but that this past year only found one adult lamprey spawning, well, tr not spawning, but it was, it was a spawn hoped to be, but anyway, but, and so the upper reach of my stream that's part of the count, but I did go downstream and there were more downstream. So it may be that the upper reaches of that stream are more susceptible to that kind of stress. But as long as it feeds into bigger stream downstream, then there's opportunity for those to survive. And then they can gradually repopulate that. But yeah, the, it, 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 it dries up every now and then, which is distressing. All right. Thank you all very much. Jerry, thank you. Very welcome. Very welcome.
thank you for a wonderful evening and telling your great stories that you shared and we just don't want it to end so we want you back soon thank you so much um, and we look forward to having you at kids in nature day next may um, so please join our next webinar on november 2nd when dr lewis daniel will be giving an eye-opening overview of the critical state of our marine fisheries in North Carolina. And if you have not heard some of the facts and figures around that, this is gonna be an eye opener. Please do um, tune in for that. Um, thanks to the webinar audience tonight for joining. I hope you enjoyed it. I know we all did here in Holly Springs. And uh, this is the conclusion of our webinar.